So thank you all uh, for coming back again today. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce three of my colleagues this morning. And we're going to talk about um, some various issues. Firstly, we're going to talk about how to create quality stat questions. We're then going to look at some of the more technical authoring processes. And lastly, we're going to uh, talk about how to assess proof online. Um, so before we do that, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, this is the Moodle course that we've set up to support this workshops today. And can I ask everyone to place your questions in the question and answer forum? Um, the advantage of placing your questions here will be that after the session, uh, we can continue to answer those. We can have follow-up discussion if we want to, and they won't get lost in the Zoom chat when you close the Zoom chat down. So it'll be, just be easier to manage the record of the, of the discussions. And it will also help to thread the discussions. So um, by all means, use the chat. We'll try and monitor that. But please, um, the forum might be a more sensible place to put the questions. It's worked well in the past. Good. Well, um, I would like to start by introducing my colleague, Constantina Zerva. Uh, Dr. Zerva has been working with us at the University of Edinburgh for a couple of years. Her role is to support academic staff by writing stat questions. Um, so she writes stat questions basically full time for us. And part of that is to make sure that the questions are of the quality that we want, that they work, that they continue to work every year, and that we have opportunities to improve those when we've seen what students respond and what feedback might be, uh, might be useful to add later. So uh, I hand over to Dr. Zerva uh, to give us a talk about writing quality questions in stack. Okay, thank you, Chris. I'll, I'll share my screen now. So, uh, that. So again, I'm not sure which one do you see, the one with the notes or the one without the notes? Sorry about that. I see your slide without the notes, that's fine. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk about writing quality stack questions and to give you some hints of how to create uh, robust questions for your courses. So the important topics that I will cover is how to keep your work tidy, naming questions, categories, uh, and question bags, uh, the requirements for to, to create a basic stack question, question test and testing, that is uh, part actually of how to create a working stack question, but it's a big topic on its own, that's why I want to highlight, and looking at students' responses and improving their potential response fee. So when you create your course in Moodle, this is uh, what you see. You can add or remove topics and quizzes in a way that uh, works better for your course. Try to give names that reflect the purpose and content of your quiz. Here is an example from our linear algebra course where we have uh, all the weekly assessed quizzes gathered together. Now having names like, uh, I don't know, just Quiz one, it may be very minimal because it doesn't give a lot of information of what the quiz is about. When students come back to revise a specific topic, they will need to look at the syllabus or the assessment mapping to identify each topic. So I think it's more helpful to give some more information of the topic of the quiz. Uh, this is another example from one of our courses. So next to the quiz, we have like a small uh, note of what the quiz is about, like one is about intervals or errors. So that's that's a useful hint. So you must make an effort to keep your question bank tidy, otherwise you'll find yourself at a loss. You can access the categories from the left-hand side menu under the course administrator. Um, so by clicking categories, uh, you can create um, categories, subcategories, where you can organize your questions. So this can be like week by week or by chapter or whatever, or by topic or whatever it makes sense to you. 
But if you have all your questions under one category, it will be very difficult to find them in the future. Another important aspect of keeping yourself organized is the question naming. The question name should be meaningful and consistent. It needs to contain information to identify the question in the future. Um, like for example, some of the question name, it could include uh, the week, uh, which question it is and information of what the question is about, to all the lecture you're using the question or homework two, uh, question three, what the question is about. Try to avoid names like that, just question one. Uh, otherwise, it will be uh, very difficult to find what the question is like after a couple of months. You won't remember anything about it. So let's see the requirements for a basic working stack question. Uh, we need to have some minimal random variables. Uh, it's a good practice to commit the maxima code. Uh, you need to include work solution, the general feedback, which is reflecting the random variables. Consider likely mistakes and that specific feedback to test for this. I would say this is optima, optional for this for minimum working question. So you may not add this when you first build a stack question. And that question tests one correct and at least one incorrect variant for the test. So about the randomization. randomization. Randomizing question is one of the key features of stack. But be sensible with the randomization. A very sophisticated or a very complicated randomization is not always the best. Uh, let's say you need to generate prime numbers for your question. It may be easier and probably not so time consuming, I don't know, to put 10, 15 prime numbers in a list and randomly pick one from the list uh, rather than try to use a function that returns back a prime number. Uh, another aspect of randomization, do you really need all these random variants, like 10, 20 different versions of a question look sensible for a quiz, but if you have, let's say, 100, uh, may not all of them have the same difficulty, so this is something to consider when you're doing your randomization. And also you need to accept that there will be cases that you can't have many random variables. Um, for example, when you have like trigonometry questions, how many angles uh, have a nice trig number? Um, commenting maxima code, um, try to write comments when you're writing a non-trivial piece of maxima code or when you make a not so obvious decision about your variables or about your randomization. Uh, you won't remember uh, what you wrote uh, after a few months. So when you revisit your question, you may don't know uh, what the question is doing. And it's a good practice to do that, especially if you share questions with other users, which maybe don't, don't know the way you build the question. So I just have a small example from one of our questions. And you can see uh, we have uh, some comments about uh, uh, the random variable k, which says that k needs to be larger than n, and uh, some comments of what the functions are doing. So if you have a very trivial question, maybe you don't really need to have any code, any comments at all, but that's fine. Uh, work solution or otherwise a general feedback, it needs to reflect on the random variables. You may need to define more variables which will be part of the step-by-step -step solution. And please don't leave it for later. Don't write the, don't, don't write the work solution, I don't know. Um, after a month after creating the question because it will it will take much longer to write it. So it's best practice if you write the work solution as you build your question. So that's a very small uh, example of a work solution. So we need to find the derivative uh, of 3x minus 4x squared. Of course, 3 and 4 are random variables, so they will be different uh, for each uh, student. Um, so apart from just having a variable that defines uh, the function we want to differentiate and the variable that defines the correct answer, you may also need to have variables like one that gives you back uh, the derivative of 3x and another variable that gives you back the derivative of 4x squared, or better say, of a times x and 
v times x squared. Uh, specific feedback. The specific feedback is associated with its input and its potential response tree. It gives hints on student specific mistakes or student specific answers. Uh, probably is not the most important thing to include in the first run of your quiz. Uh, it becomes more important when you have considered likely mistakes or when you have reviewed what students got wrong uh, after the first run of the quiz. So if your first question just have um, I don't know, full mark for correct answer and no mark for wrong answer and they don't give any hints, it may be fine for the first round of your quiz. Uh, question test and testing, uh, that is a big topic on its own. So it is important to test questions to ensure they work correctly. Question tests provide an automated mechanism throughout which the author may establish with confidence what the potential response trees are processing the student's answer as expected. In this way, the teacher, the teacher can record within the question itself how they expect the marking scheme to work for a variety of student answers. So let's, let's see the testing uh, just by having an example. So you can, um, so let's say we have a question you save your question and you preview it, so you can see it on a different window. Uh, if you have the authority to edit the question, then at the top right of the window, you can see the question test and deployed variants option. Uh, you follow this link and it opens a new window. This page manages both question tests and deployed variants. So initially you will have no tests and no deployed variants. At the bottom of this page, you can choose the add a test case. This opens a new page where you can create your test. So let's try to create a test that checks the correct answer. So if the student's answer, the answer one, um, is the same as teacher's answer, then we expect the score in the potential response tree, we expect the score to be one we will have no penalty. And if we have like only one potential response tree, that should be follow uh, the, true, the true branch. So after creating our test, uh, we see that um, um, the, the score will be one, the expected score should be one, and we won't have any penalty. So this is a test case in, uh, for, for the correct answer. So how many test cases do you need to have in your questions? So you need to have one test case for a correct response, uh, one test case for a total incorrect answer. Uh, maybe some invalid responses, especially if you have a syntactically valid expressions. Um, adding a test case is useful to confirm that the potential, uh, that the potential problems is caused by the question. Um, and then you need to leave the answer note null. And uh, if you have, um, if you consider students' mistakes, you may need to have one example of each distinction you wish to make. And especially if you have added some specific feedback, you may want to test also these cases. So a Moodle administrator can run all of the question tests within a particular course, and uh, it's very good to do it at least once per year to check all your questions in your course and to see if they pass all the test cases. So for the previous, for the previous simple question, uh, this is the test case of when the student puts a completely uh, wrong answer. So the score you, will be zero and the expected score will be zero. And you may want to have a penalty uh, for the student for putting a wrong answer, especially if, if they will resubmit their, their answer later. And also this is a test case uh, for an invalid expression. Like in the question we had, we don't allow them to multiply the two matrices. Like they need to do all the math and put the final answer and not like type something, adding the two matrices or multiply them. So in that case, this is an invalid answer. So that's a test case for that. So after having creating your question, 
it's a good practice just to, to read it and see uh, if the phrasing of the question is clear to the students or will the students know how to input an answer. Maybe you want to put a syntax hint, a message that will help them. And um, will the validation help by telling the students, let's say if you have a question for significant figures, to tell them how many significant figures is expected. Like, you don't want to penalize the students for this kind of technicality. So after having run your quizzes on the first go, you can uh, review your students' answers uh, in order to give better feedback. So now in staff, we have a new feature, which is called Basic Question Use Report, uh, which will help for this. So the example that I have here is a question with uh, no random variables. I suppose it's easier to understand how the feature works. So the student needs to type uh, as an answer which, which line has the fallacy. And you can see the student's answer and 53, almost 53% of them uh, chose line eight, which is the correct one. And you can see some other uh, possible answers that they put, like a good ratio and 70% of them chose line four and then 11% of them chose last five. So if you see like a big group of your students do the same mistake, uh, you can use this information by adding uh, more specific feedback to your questions. So when you have questions with uh, random variables, I'll go back to the question with the two matrices. Um, so you have this information for each uh, variant so maybe this is a bit more complicated. So for this question for variant eight, you can see that 86% of the students put the correct answer. And you have uh, some information about people that put some wrong answers. So again, you can use this information to, to build your feedback. And I think that that was me. I tried to cover a lot of stuff and I don't know if I was out of time or not. I didn't keep any track of time. Thanks, Constantina. Um, so um, we do have some time for questions. If you'd like to put, if they're, um, they can either go in the chat, but better in the forum, perhaps. Um, Constantina, thank you. The work you're doing is, it's not as glamorous as uh, conceptual learning or some of the other things that we might do, but it's so important. We're all in this for the long game and keeping your house tidy, creating quality questions, testing them and improving them uh, is such important work uh, to make sure that we're really doing the best job we can. I would really encourage people to take what you've said seriously. And some of that is hard won, hard won knowledge. Yes, <laughs> from, from losing questions and uh, and struggling to remember what you wrote in your code and all these other things that we all do. Okay, so let me uh, have a quick look at the, I'm going to have to just quick look at the forums there's, and see what's going on. There's a question here from Thomas for you, Constantina. Um, goes, Thanks. how exactly does the null answer node work? What has to happen in the PRT to reach that? In the example of the matrix multiplication, if the calculations are not allowed, can that not be caught at validation stage? Uh, yes, so if, if it's not allowed, the students won't be able to submit uh, their answer, but you also want to verify that this is actually the case and uh, that it will not marked in a different way. So you want to make sure from with the test case that it will, uh, it will be as an invalid answer and it, will, and it won't get marked at all. So maybe in a, in a trivial question like that, you don't really need to have it, but there are some special cases that it may be important to have an invalid test case to test that things work, um, work okay or in the way you like them to work. Okay, so, so the null answer node means exactly that the error is caught at the validation stage, yes. is that right? Okay. Thanks, Constantina. 
Jacques, have you got a question about randomization? Yes, I do. <clears throat> so what I don't quite understand is um, randomization. I mean, so you generate, well, you put your random numbers. So in principle, it generates a very vast uh, series of questions. But is it typically used it to, to generate those beforehand using this deployment feature and then select nine of those questions and then use them for the students always? I mean, is that the best? Is that the way it works? And is it the best way to? Yeah, so I, I should have had one more slide of having some uh, deployed variants. So let's say uh, you have a very trivial question, like find the integral of uh, a x squared. Okay, and this a, you can have like rand, I don't know, 100 values of a, but when you go, um, I'll try to find the slide, at least you can see the top of it. Uh, that one. Um, so at the beginning, it has no deployed variants. Then you can uh, undeploy a specific amount of variants. Like, I don't know, you don't want all these 100 uh, different values. You may want to deploy 10. So every time you run your quiz, it will randomly pick one of these 10 uh, variants of your question. If that makes sense. So you deploy a specific amount of, uh, of variants of your question, and, this, and these variants are the ones that the students will see. So, so in other words, the question does not run the Maxima code for randomization. It just goes and pick one of the, the, um, the variants you've you've generated earlier. Yes. And the advantage of that, Constantine, why do we do that? So, it's, so otherwise, you, the quiz will completely pick a random, a random variant, which you won't know, and you won't be able to review it later. So by, by having this, I don't know, pre-generated pre random instances of the question, you can go and review them. So the advice is to review each, each of them and never put in front of students a question which is truly random. I mean, which you haven't seen before. So the, the other advantage of uh, pre-generating random variants is that you test them in advance. So the students only see variants that we've tested. Right? Um, do you mind if I share my screen, Constantina? Because no. I've, uh, I've navigated to the... Um, I've navigated to the... Can you... Keep I've navigated it. to the, uh, this is the, in the demonstration site, we have this trivial question. This is the link Constantina has mentioned. And if we click on that, these are the versions the student will see. Uh, and you can just eyeball that they're all reasonably similar. And if we run uh, all the tests uh, on these, right? Yeah, that takes a while. It takes a while because we're running every test on every random version. Now I know that one of these is going to fail because I've set that up to fail and you can, um, you can see in a minute that there's one of these tests is failing. So what's gone wrong with this question? Okay, so these tests pass, it's marking the correct answer correctly, but one of these tests is failing. And so, you know, from year to year, we can now figure out, you know, why this test is failing and so on and what's going wrong. But um, from year to year, this ability to make sure the questions work before the students see them and make sure they're still working the next year is absolutely invaluable. And it, it borrows some unit testing in software engineering. Um, I should have done this years ago. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks. I have another question from the forum. Um, Martin asks, what is an efficient way to ask for an integer with minimum clicks from standard settings? I want to refuse any inline computation, just numbers as input. Sorry, can you repeat it? Because I had an internet disruption. Okay. What is an efficient way to ask for an integer with minimum clicks from standard settings? I want to refuse any inline computation, just numbers as input. I'm not quite sure I can understand the question. So uh, maybe I can uh, explain. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, the, the question is, if I have a stack question, usually, usually a multi-part question where I just ask for the node number in a finite element model or like that, and I, or just an integer value. I want to ask for in, an integer value. And sometimes I find that uh, the students input expressions like two, uh, three times four or uh, three. Oh, uh, okay. Like so, you don't, so you and don't I, want to allow them to put this. Exactly, and uh, I do not want to use them some variables or whatever. And I found some ways how to do that, but they seem very complicated. So, right. in the inbox, in the input uh, to the same screen, Chris, or you can go to one question and just go no, down. You don't don't go, uh, okay, I need to open, uh, yes, I need to open stack question somewhere. So I, I have uh, described that also in the uh, stack forum in, in the, on the Moodle side. <laughs> All right, let's, <laughs> so not, I, uh, let's not answer that question, right, uh, directly. But what, um, what I think we should say, because time is running out and it's, it's nearly time for George to start, is uh, are two things. The first one is there's an interesting decision to be made about when a number is a number, isn't it? Um, you know, is one plus one or you had two times three is that really what we want or do we actually just want the number? And we sometimes have to make these fine distinctions. Um, so uh, we'll certainly respond to that and tell you how to do it. The second thing is sometimes these questions, we just don't have the feature now because we just either haven't had time or no one's asked for it before. And features like that, which are very sensible, we really want, to, we really want, to, we really want that feature, then we'll just add it, right? I mean, this is an open source project and we, we push the project forward by fulfilling these needs. Um, and then the last thing on this topic, because it's just sprung to mind, is that we'll have to decide, I mean, do you, are you going to allow a minus sign in here? And if you allow a minus sign, how are you going to distinguish between minus six and uh, 10 take away four, right? I mean, it's sort of, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it just becomes, um, uh, you know, uh, anyway. So what we'll do is we will resolve that properly, but you can see there are, you know, there are um, things to do there. It's not entirely trivial. Yeah, okay. you don't guess that that are special needs. You think it's quite an ordinary thing. I think it's a very sensible suggestion, right? I mean, we should support that. We want the students to give a number and not some arith arithmetical expression equivalent to the number. But um, then the easiest way is just to add the forbidden word. Like you don't want to allow multiplication symbol. So in your input answers, um, if you open the input answer, you can see a whole list of stuff you can do so somewhere it says forbidden words so I yeah. to share my screen. if you have a lot of them you do a quite uh, spend quite some time to to click uh, all the the um, parameters such that uh, you get this and it's it's quite a, a sort of dance you perform every time sure. you make it I get this completely. So there's this whole tension in stack between what should be a feature which is supported as part of the core and what you need to do on a question by question basis. And speaking personally, I have a very low pain threshold. And if I find myself doing the same tedious thing on loads of questions, then that probably should be a feature that we add in the core. So I'm really grateful that you've raised that because that sounds like a very sensible request that we would want to support centrally. Uh, and yeah. that is the way that project has proceeded. So without getting completely bogged down in the technicality of that, because I will answer it on the, on yeah, the yeah. forum. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. But it's, I'm, I'm grateful you've raised it here because it does allow me to say a few things about how the whole project develops when people raise these needs and we decide to add that as a core feature. Um, yeah, you encouraged us on Monday, so I just tried. Yeah, great. Good. Let's move on to the second talk. Thank you so much, Constantina, for virtual You're clap. Welcome. Um, I really appreciate you putting together that so carefully. That's um, really helpful. So um, we're now going to move on. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, George Kinnear. Dr. Kinnear is a lecturer in the School of Mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he has written a fully online course, and there is a sample week of that on our demo site. I would strongly encourage you to look at that, uh, mostly because of the educational design based on well-established educational research principles that have been carried out in a systematic way in that course. Um, so please have a look at that if you haven't seen it. Um, but today, uh, Dr. Kinnear is going to talk about uh, some, more, some of the more advanced features of authoring questions. So, George. Thank you. My Zoom just does this thing where it doesn't show me people's faces and it's kind of strange not 
seeing people. So just excuse me while I get that working. Okay, seems I can't see people. Um, right, so as Chris was saying, I've, I've written a whole course online. Um, and you can see an example of that on the demo site. Um, what I wanted to talk about today was something that sort of worried me as I was putting all of this together. Because the students are spending so much time looking at these questions, I wanted them to look nice. Um, and now some of this is maybe just me being overly pedantic, but um, I think some of it is quite important actually that the students have a consistent experience as they go through um, working with the course materials. And I think some of the, some of the kind of extra features that I'm going to use make the question just more usable and nice to work with. Um, so what I'd like to tell you about, um, first of all, is how to, to use Maxima cleverly. So we've got the power of the computer algebra system behind the scenes, and there are certain ways that you can use it more or less effectively. Um, then I'll share some tips about presentation, so how to make the questions look nice. Um, and then finally, I know that there are some people interested in how to use multiple choice questions, and you'll see in the, the demo week that multiple choice questions do crop up. Um, it's something that I've had some arguments with Chris about, so his kind of whole philosophy for Stack was to not use multiple choice questions. The point was the students type in an answer. Um, but I do think they're useful in some ways, and we've been able to add in some extra features to make them a bit easier to write. So I'll share some examples of those as well. Um, I should also say that I've got lots of links to the documentation in these slides. Um, I'm going to make the slides available on the course website. Um, and also, all the questions that I'm showing, they'll be available as a quiz so that you can try them out um, and also available to download. So you'll have all the code and you can uh, work with these. So using Maxima, um, if you're authoring a lot of stack questions, it's useful to have Maxima on your desktop. So you can download um, this windowed version of Maxima, which gives you the console you can type in and try things out. So I would definitely recommend that if you're doing a lot of uh, stack authoring. It's, it's useful to be able to test things out um, before you go to typing them into the question form. It's not quite that simple though, because stack has a whole lot of extra functions going on. So things like um, being able to do randomization, um, and there's many, many different functions that are, are in the documentation as well. So you can't use those in the, the Maxima that you just download off the internet. So there is a little step that you need to do to set up what's known as the sandbox. So that's all explained on the documentation. I guess I should admit at this point, I've not got the sandbox working on my laptop. Um, I've not got around to sorting that out. Um, it's working on the, the desktop machine in my office, but I've not got access to that just now. And I've not been authoring a lot of stack questions over the past few weeks, so I've not got around to setting it up on my laptop. Um, but that's worth it if you want to be able to really see what it's like to, to write a stack question just on your desktop without having to go on to the middle server. So th the point of using Maxima is um, to be able to do some powerful things when you're, for example, giving feedback. So you're writing your work solution and you want to write out um, this integral, for example. So this is an example of a question where I was doing integration by substitution. Um, so that's actually what I had in the, the work solution. So here I'm writing some LaTeX and within that I'm embedding the value A, which in this case was two, the value B was three, expression, so that's my maxima expression, which is this whole rational function here. And then I'm differentiating, uh, integrating with respect to, I've got a random variable for this, so I can change the, the variable that we're integrating with respect to. And that was the X there. So that's me taking really fine control of how I want the expression to appear. And I'm having to write a lot of LaTeX code to do that as well. But you can actually just use Maxima to do this. So this is just saying integrate the expression with respect to V from A to B. And in Maxima language, putting in this apostrophe means don't actually do the integration, but just show it as an integral. And it gives us exactly the same result. And it's kind of easier to read, I think, as well. But there is an art to this, because once I've done the substitution, I might then want to do this, um, which is you know, just transposing the exact same expression. I've just changed things to what they need to be. Um, 
And I might think, oh, well, in Maxima, I would just do it in exactly the same way. But unfortunately, Maxima does lots of simplification on things. So sometimes you find yourself fighting against the way that Maxima will want to, to simplify things. And sometimes you do need to take back control and use the a kind of more spelling it out in LaTeX sort of way. But I would recommend trying to do this sort of way as, as far as possible and only resort to having to, to really type lots of stuff out if, if it's not quite looking as nice as you would like it to. So there's that tension between having the simpler code by using clever Maxima and kind of taking control of how things appear. Um, but I think it is worth learning, and there's an example from the docs um, that illustrates this quite nicely. So if you want to show the working for adding together two matrices, this would be a complete nightmare to write out by hand if you had all of these individual entries and then you wanted to add them all up. You're going to have a massive piece of LaTeX at the end of that. Um, in the docs, it shows you how to do it in just a few lines. So um, the key thing here is we can turn off Maxima's inclination to simplify everything. So once we do that, we take our matrices, we do this kind of cryptic looking bit of code, um, which essentially does the addition for us, um, and then turns it back into a matrix. Um, and then we can produce that line above just by this simple line here. So it's much kind of neater and clearer. The key thing here is this, this thing about turning off simplification. So if you really want to um, have control and be able to show intermediate steps and in working, it's important to, to be able to use that. And you can turn it on and off at will um, by using simp false or simp true. And if you do want to, um, so simplification is turned off here, but we can still simplify things with a, an explicit command, like evaluate this with simplification. So here's another example that would be an absolute nightmare to write out by hand. So this was a, a randomized thing where I wanted them to expand this um, binomial term to a certain power. And so all of this is randomized. Um, and I wanted to be able to write out the, the full solution here. So I don't want to, to spend an awful long time going through all the code here, um, but just to say that this first line here is producing this line. So with simplification off, I'm producing a sum, so that's these plus signs here, um, of all the different terms that I make up as a binomial multiplied by a term to a power and another term to a power. So it's quite mathematical, and it's just like using sort of sigma notation. To go to the next line, I wanted to emphasize these multiplications. So I just wanted to point out this other feature that's sort of maybe not apparent from the documentation at first glance. Um, but there is the, this option to control the way that multiplication is displayed. So my general setting here is that the multiplication signs are just kind of hidden, but I can, within the code, turn on multiplication being shown as a dot. So that's what happens on this line. And then for the final line, I make it blank again. So it's worth knowing that that's an option, so you can set it to either a blank, a dot, or a cross. So now turning to presentation issues and how to style your questions. Um, so I've got four points that I'd like to, to cover here. So first of all, the idea of using HTML and, and styling. So I think by default on a, a middle server, this will be the editor that you would see. So if you're editing a question, you'll have this sort of what you see is what you get type editor. But behind the scenes, there is this HTML code. So to see that, you click on this button on the editor, and then this button appears. You click on that one, and it turns the, the text into the actual underlying HTML, and you can edit that directly. Um, it's worth knowing that's there, because sometimes if you copy and paste things across, um, it will add in spurious HTML and make it look a bit of a mess. And you can go in and kind of tidy that up so it's just clean HTML. Um, Another feature of this is that within the HTML, you can apply consistent styles to things. So just a, a trivial level, um, here's a question from my course. And throughout, I tried to adopt the style that if I had multi-part questions, I would make these letters bold. 
I don't, I don't think it's a big deal, um, but I think it does help to give that sense of consistency if you're always doing things in the same way. So I'm not saying that's necessarily the thing to do, but whatever you decide to do, I think trying to do it consistently throughout your materials will make things seem more coherent. Um, and in that vein, we're going to be hearing more um, after the break from Robbie about um, proof. And we've just added in some styles, so if you want to include proofs, you can style them using HTML as well. Um, just at this point, to give a, an extra plug to this um, Helm project that we've got going on. So the, there's this massive set of workbooks for engineering maths um, known as Helm. And what we're doing just now in Edinburgh is taking those and turning them into stack quizzes in the, the style of my online course. And we've developed a, a style guide for this. Um, it's still a kind of work in progress, but the idea here is to produce these materials using styling in a consistent way. Um, and you may not like the way these look, but then because you've set the questions up to use these styles, it's just a matter of then changing the styles and the appearance of the questions will update correspondingly. So you can, um, you can make those changes at a global level rather than having to go through all your questions and change each one. So a couple of new features to mention about Stacks. These have just come in in the, the, one of the most uh, recent releases. So before, I had a few, a few questions in my course like this where I wanted students to fill in the blanks in a piece of working. So this was in the idea of a, a faded worked example where rather than have the students solve the whole problem, I want to show them a scaffolded version of it and have them fill in some parts of it. And it does get a bit messy if you've got kind of multiple boxes where you want students to put answers and you want to show them the validation. So how the system is interpreting their answer. Um, so you end up with this massive set of boxes at the bottom. There is now a feature for compact validation. So you can turn that into this where next to the box that the student's typing in their answer, the, the way that their answer has been interpreted appears directly. Um, I've not quite decided the, the nicest way to use this yet, so I'm just you know, being honest here and maybe get some feedback from people and see what you think. I put both of these versions in the quiz that you can try out. Um, so it's using the, this new setting, Compact. Um, I'm not sure whether it's helpful to have it appearing and you've got kind of two versions of it in the, in the same bracket, or if it's nicer to see what the whole expression looks like um, in a kind of separate place. I think. It's nice here that you can see as you type, the change is happening right next to where you're typing. Um, so I, there's a kind of trade-off there, which I've not quite resolved in my head. Um, another nice feature, so this is a question that I've talked about before um, from my course where students type in what they think are the most important standard derivatives. And this had some issues, so again, I wouldn't want to have nine of these big validation boxes at the bottom, so I had to just turn them off for that question, which I don't think was great because if you miss a star or whatever, um, you're not going to get the, the helpful validation feedback. So now with the, the compact validation, it's possible to add those back in. Um, but also the, the way the feedback works here, um, with the potential response tree feedback, I wanted to give feedback on each row, but then also give some overall feedback. And so this has inspired a new feature where we can now have different styles of potential response tree feedback. So in this case, we're just showing the symbol, so a tick or a cross, um, based on whether they're getting the marks or not. Um, and none of the, the text that might be associated with, with the feedback. And there's also this option for just purely formative feedback. So there's no ticks or crosses um, or no marks associated with this potential response tree. It's just a sort of general evaluative statement. So it's useful to know that those are, are features that you can use as well for giving feedback. Um, and it's possible to combine these. So I think having both of these new features for compact validation and compact feedback has made this question much nicer to use. So when students are typing in their expressions, they now see how the system is interpreting it. Um, and I think the, the feedback just looks much nicer being able to make it purely formative um, takes the sting out of getting a red cross even when you, you basically got everything right. Um, so it's nice to have that option. 
um, graphing. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, I think there, there are three main options that I've used. So first of all, just to embed a static image. And for that, I would recommend using SVG um, because it's a vector graphic. It means that the students can zoom in and scale it as much as they want. Um, and I would recommend using Inkscape, which is free software for, for creating those. Um, it's possible to use Maximus plotting commands. So there's an example question that you can see where I've produced various graphs of uh, Quartix, Quintix, something like that. Um, so that's just using a, a Maxima command and it will produce a plot again in SVG directly into your question. Um, JSX graph is another sort of powerful feature that's available. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. So you need to learn how to use the, the features of JSX graph. Um, and I have a, a session at the EMS conference next week where I'll go into more detail about how I've used JSX graph in different ways in the course. Um, now, finally, about multiple choice questions. I think these do have a place. Um, so here, for example, um, this is just a basic question about a quadratic, but um, I want to know what type of stationary point it is. That's a natural sort of multiple choice question. The way multiple choice works. Um, so here's a, an example of it being a drop down. Um, the way it works in stack is that you provide a list of all the options. So it's a list of lists in Maxima code. So the teacher answer for this question is this list where the first expression is an actual Maxima expression. So that their answer is in this case, the Maxima expression B. Um, you set whether it's true or false, whether it's the correct answer or not and then the text that they will see. And then when you are setting up your input, in this case, I chose a drop-down list and I supply this list of lists as the model answer. And then when grading it, I just need to check that the student answer is indeed C, which is the, the correct answer in this case. So that's for a nice simple multiple choice. Um, I couldn't be happy just with that. So I wanted to make life hard for myself. Um, I've used multiple choice in lots of different ways, so I, I want to just share a few examples of that. So here I wanted to present different forms of um, possible equations for this graph. So here I've given what the correct form is as a maxima variable, and now I've got a list of all the different distractors, so the wrong options. And these are specified in terms of my random variables a, b, and c. So that, in this case, will be um, one, three, and five, um, but that will vary with, with the random versions. Um, there is this helper function available, um, so a multi-selection question with display style, um, where you provide your list of correct options and then how many of those you want to select, and then your list of incorrect options and how many of those you want to select. And this function will take care of building the list of lists which you need to provide to create a multiple choice question. So that will be returned as the, the first argument from the first uh, element of the, the result of this function. So that is what we want to make the, the teacher answer now, the model answer for the input. Um, and you can also easily extract from that what are the correct and incorrect options. Um, Another example of this in, in practice, so I want to find all the vectors parallel to a given one. So again, this was randomized, but just for example, so this was the V was this vector here. I produce a list of parallel and not parallel options. So these are just written using maxima. So multiplying the vector V by two, it's, it is going to be parallel. Um, so in that case, I've got four different parallel ones, four different not parallel ones. Okay, so there's you're seeing here comment and code is useful. I scratched my head and wondered what was going on here. Um, it's because these are actually lists rather than vectors. So we want to turn them into column vectors because I wanted them to be displayed as columns. Um, and now I do this multi selection question alpha. So that gives each thing a name. So A, B, C, D. And I'm only selecting three out of the four in each case here as well. So each time a student tries a different random version of this, they'll see slightly different options appearing, um, which is a nice feature. 
Um, so that's using the, these settings here. Um, and a final example, um, just to show how powerful this can be, if I want to say which of these differential equations are separable, um, again, it's just a matter of specifying in maxima language. Um, so these are three different um, separable ones, or it's four actually, um, and four different not separable ones. And then in each case, we're going to select two out of the four. Um, this one just also adds an extra feature where um, if they get it kind of partially right, we can try and give them some partial credit. So rather than just checking that they get exactly the correct set of answers, um, maybe if they've got identified a subset of the correct answers and they've not given any incorrect ones, we'll give them half marks. Um, and otherwise, we'll give them some useful feedback about um, which ones were correctly or incorrectly selected. Okay, and that was me. Thanks, George. Um, I hope that's uh, given folks some ideas. Um, let's uh, look, look back at the questions in the question forum. So we've got some few minutes to ask George questions. Um, I saw that Sam and Heather were wondering about forbidden maxima expressions, but I think Tim left some, some helpful comments in the chat. So I wonder, is there still a Sam and Heather, I do still have questions for for uh, forbidden maxima expressions, or is that all cleared up now? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what the status of some things are. So when I was getting, when I was being really fussy about the way certain multiple choice questions were being displayed, I was having to use the string concatenation function. And I think Chris sucked his teeth when I said that. So um, that may not be allowed, I'm not sure. Um, it was just a general question. How, you know, if I had Maximo was playing around with it, would I expect most things to work in stack? Yeah, you'd expect, so there are, um, we, we've had to restrict what you can use on the server. Um, so uh, expect anything that writes files to fail. Uh, we don't allow users to write files uh, or read files off the server for obvious reasons. Um, commands which uh, execute things like new plot to make the plots are restricted. So again, for obvious reasons. Um, because we have to check uh, Maxima is an open source project as well, and there are lots of contributed libraries. So we have to check uh, what the libraries are really doing before we allow them. So, um, and there's one library, there's a, a package for uh, graph theory, the discrete mass and graph theory. Uh -huh. And that does some very strange file writing stuff, which is really mm -hmm. a shame because the package would be extremely useful, but we just can't, we just can't incorporate it at this point. I'll watch that. So it, well, I mean, it, um, we have carefully looked at what the functions do. Um, so yeah, expect things to work, but there are good reasons why we're not, not allowing some things. And I'd be happy to talk about that in particular cases. Sure. Often, often it's, um, you know, we, we allow things now. So if something's not allowed, it could just be simply that we haven't looked at it. There may be absolutely nothing wrong with it and we'll just review it. If you really need it, we'll review it and allow it. Um, but we're not just allowing everything and um, yeah, hoping. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was going to suggest in George's slide where he showed the separate validation on like a fraction with mm -hmm. brackets that maybe if you did the different colors for the validation, then it would be easier for the eye to see what you'd put in and what it validated looked like. Uh, yeah, so you mean the input boxes versus the validation boxes, yeah. having them appear sort of differently colored? Yeah, having it all in white was confusing, but I think if you had gray or something, yeah. the validation. Yeah. So the compact validation, these other things, were all a result of people making suggestions, and I'm very open to suggestions. Um, uh, so yeah, we can certainly... Uh, Look good. The whole thing improves. What, what fascinates me is this is a tool and people use it in ways I never anticipated and couldn't imagine. And often they're fighting against the system when it's a thoroughly sensible thing to do and we should support it. So 
if people feel like they're doing something unnatural or fighting against it, like uh, George's examples of the multi-choice builder functions, they're a, a, real, um, a real positive benefit that just save a lot of time and hassle. Um, so, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that was an example of where Stack didn't quite do what I wanted it to do in an easy way. I was having to fight a bit, but then Stack just incorporated it um, to make to make my life easier. Yeah. Thanks, George. I think you've uh, some really interesting uh, overview of some of the things you might not see straight away when you work through the Author Quick Start Guide and so on. But thank you, thank you very much indeed. And we'll follow up more specific questions in the in the forum in due course if people have got comments or suggestions there. Yeah, and just to add to the. The stuff is now available on the course page. So I've made available an example of the, all the questions that I showed and the slides are there. But, but before you do that, the last speaker today <laughs> is my uh, colleague Robbie Bickerton, also from University of Edinburgh. So Dr. Bickerton was employed more recently and he and I have been working on how to uh, assess proof um, because that's the heart of our discipline for, for mathematics. Now I've um, I mean, I think we're a long way from assessing freeform proof, right? I mean, I've been trying to establish links with the automatic theorem proving community and all the rest of it, but it's just, it's just a long way away. And um, so uh, what Dr. Bickerton is going to talk about next is our attempts to automatically assess proof and understanding of proof with stack. So Robbie, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Let me share my screen. There we go. So I think I'm going to leave this uh, in this mode rather than presentation mode because for some reason my mouse keeps going missing every time, every time I put it in presentation mode. So as Chris said, uh, we've been looking into what we can do with regards to assessing proof in stack. <clears throat> so the way I thought this session would work would be me talking at you all for about 20 minutes, half an hour. And then I'd maybe show you an example of what one of our proof comprehension exercises looks like in stack. So I've structured this talk in the sense of each slide in theory should answer some of the most common questions I get about this topic. And I will pause for questions if there's anything that I haven't addressed. So why do we want to assess proof online? Well, as Chris said, Proof is essential to mathematics. It's something that we, something that maths is built upon, and it's something that we want all of our undergraduate students to be able to engage with and to understand. So why do we want to do this online? Well, many students traditionally are taught proof in the form of lectures, where they are given a definition, then a theorem, then they are taken through a proof and they are expected to listen to their lecturer read through this proof and then at some point reproduce it, whether that be in an assignment or in an exam. Now the issue with just listening to a proof being proved or just reading through a proof is that these aren't necessarily active engagement. They aren't necessarily engaging with the proof. So our aim was to use online assessment and online tasks within Stack to try and get the students to engage with individual proofs more. And this allowed us to have a greater scope for proof tasks outside of just reading proofs or writing proofs. And of course, more importantly, if this doesn't have you convinced that this is a worthwhile thing, after COVID-19, unfortunately, this kind of thing is pretty much a necessity as more and more things are going to have to be pushed online. Now, as Chris said, there are some limitations with what we can do. The, the biggest one being that we can't automatically assess a free form argument. So we can't get students to upload a proof of the Riemann hypothesis and get that automatically marked. So we have to be slightly more subtle. So what we've done is to use a variety of comprehension tasks to try and assess whether students understand proofs rather than getting them to provide a full argument. But this leads us into a slight problem because 
what does it mean for a student to understand a proof? And I've spoken to a lot of a lot of mathematicians and a lot of mathematics educators, and no one can really seem to agree on the answer to this question. So, for example, do we think a student has understood a proof if they are able to reproduce it fully and correctly from a lecture that they've been to or from a book? Okay, but what happens if that student has just happened to memorize the proof? Does that mean they've necessarily understood it? I don't know. And I don't necessarily have an answer to this question. And it's just something that we have to bear in mind when we're writing these online questions, because we keep, we need to be aware of what we actually want to test the student about with regards to the proof. The final issue is one of a sense of technical expertise. So my background isn't necessarily as a, as a stack expert. I was a, I was a pure mathematician and I only started writing stack questions in the last year. So hopefully this session can kind of mitigate the lack of technical knowledge somewhat. But I found that proof questions aren't necessarily the most complicated ones to write in stack. Hopefully this, this will become clear over the rest of my talk. So how do we solve the, these issues that I've mentioned? Well, I've already talked about proof comprehension exercises, and these can take a variety of forms. And in fact, we've, we've used several different types. So these can involve things like asking students to provide the structure of a proof. So is a proof a contradiction? Is it an if and only if proof? Questions along that line. It can also involve asking students to pick out specific lines from a proof. But there are also a couple of other things that we can do. So I mentioned proof fading here. George talked about faded worked examples in his talk. We can do something similar for proofs. So for example, we could provide the structure of an induction proof, but then leave the lines of calculation blank for the student to provide. We can then automatically assess the calculations that the students are doing. And finally, there is an option in Stack for the implementation of human marked questions. So there is an, a, a note answer type, answer type where students can type in their answers, but they have to be marked by a human. So it is possible to do within Stack. So the next part of my talk is going to be about specifically a Stack question that I wrote last year about a, about a proof for one of our courses. Um, it's a first year proof introduction to proofs course here at, uh, here at Edinburgh. I should say that everything I am going to speak about in these slides and in my talk today, they're all available in a paper that Chris and I wrote that's currently available on the archive. And I put a link to that in the Moodle site for this workshop. And I will reference it again at the end of, our, end of my slides. So before I move on, maybe I should stop for questions briefly. Um, I, my chat seems to have disappeared. So if anyone can tell me if there's any questions coming up. I don't think there's been any, any specifically for you, Robbie. I think you're okay. I'll Excellent. keep an eye out. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So I'll push on. So this is the general process that I've been going through every time I want to take a proof either from a course textbook or from course notes and to turn it into a series of stack comprehension questions. So the first task is how do I select a suitable proof? What proofs, uh, what proofs do I need? And there's actually quite a lot that goes into this selection of appropriate proofs. But we are essentially being driven by a practical need. So most often the reason that I would choose a proof is because a course leader would want to assess that proof. So it, it somewhat mitigates the choice that you have. <clears throat> but really it comes down to, to a teaching decision in your courses. What do you want to assess? What proofs do you think are important? <clears throat> the next step was to break down any given proof 
essentially line by line. So the reason that I do this will become more apparent when I talk about putting this in stack. But at this stage, this was just to help me as a potential question author to understand the different elements that were going into making up a proof. And again, this becomes a matter of instinct or mathematical and educational expertise to identify what we mean by the key elements of each proof. So for example, in the famous proof that there are infinitely many primes, this relies on the creation of the integer n, which is a product of all the previous primes plus one. That could be a key element of that proof because if a student can remember that they can do that, they're halfway there to proving the theorem. So in order to emphasize that, we may then want to write a question about this element of that proof. <clears throat> so after a while, it became apparent that there was a systematic way in which I could be doing this process. And this culminated in Chris and I writing this proof baseline checklist. And again, this is, this is in our paper for further information. I won't go through all of this here, but essentially this checklist is picking out all of the different parts of a proof. And the idea is that as a mathematics educator, we can then create questions that can be marked in stack that test each different aspect of the proof. So for example, point two we have here, describe the overall modular recursive structure. Well, by this, this was just what I was speaking about earlier. So in other words, we can, pretty much every proof has a, has a structure that, or at least the proofs that our students are going to be meeting. So we can 90% of the time ask them, what is that structure? What is happening in that proof? This checklist isn't designed to be used in order, and it's not the case that every item is going to apply to every type of proof. So not everything is going to be suitable. And again, it comes down to a teaching decision about what you want to assess within the checklist. So for example, uh, if we have for an if then proof in step seven, is the converse true or false? We may not be in the situation to ask this question. So we don't have to use all of these items. So in order to make this a little bit more clear, I'm going to take you through an example of a question that I wrote. And this was the theorem that we selected. And this appeared, as I said, in a first year introduction to proof course at Edinburgh. And theorem is if we have a bounded, se bounded increasing sequence, then the limit exists. And this is the proof that is taken verbatim from a course textbook. So this is the, the paragraph of the proof that the students will see in a textbook. So, as I said, the first thing to do was to break down the proof line by line and then to number those lines. So why do I want to number those lines? Well, this is a practical concern with regards to stack. So because we can't assess a free form argument, we need a way in stack that we can refer to different lines of a proof. By numbering them, it means that if we ask a student to provide a line, they can just enter the number of that line and then we can assess that automatically. I also found that it served a, a useful secondary purpose in that it helped to identify what was actually happening at each stage of the proof. So I, I found that specific, specifically with proofs that I had become very familiar with or very famous proofs, there were things that I would take for granted when I was reading them, whereas actually when I delved into them a bit more, there was possibly some subtleties I would miss on the first time around. The next step was to apply our checklist so again, you don't need to remember what specifically what these numbers are at this point, but just again to, to note that not I didn't use every item of the checklist. So for example, seven and eight didn't seem appropriate for this question. Now, the advantage of the proof that we chose here is that it has several definitions at play. The idea of an increasing sequence, the idea of a bounded sequence, and the idea of convergence. So it would be possible 
to create examples or to ask students for examples of each possible combination of these ideas. So, we, for example, in the table here, we could ask the student to provide an example of an increasing sequence that's bounded and convergent. So in other words, we would be asking the students to provide an example that satisfies our theorem. But then we can, we can use these combinations in a systematic way. So can, we ask, can a student provide an example of an increasing sequence that's bounded, but that isn't convergent? Well, this would be a counterexample to the theorem that we've just proved, but do the students understand this? So we could ask something about that. So the third line, can we have an increasing sequence that isn't bounded, that, that's convergent? Well, this would be a counterexample to a different theorem. So this would be testing students' slightly wider knowledge related to these ideas. So, as I said, in a systematic way, it doesn't take long to come up with several questions that ask students to provide several examples. So how many do we have here? We have, I think, eight different combinations. We could ask students to provide eight different examples in theory. Can I see an example? Yes, yes, that's the point of the rest of my talk. So my finished question in stack looks like this. <clears throat> so we have the proposition and the proof at the top of the page in the formatted in a separate box. George talked earlier about the, the div tags that we just implemented in stack in order to create proof environments. And again, these are to be found within the assessing proof stack docs. And as you can see, we have the proof that's numbered lines, and then we have six questions that we ask the students. So in question A, we're asking whether, <clears throat> where the completeness axiom is used within the proof. So the answer to this is actually step two. But if you think back to the initial proof from the textbook, this was actually explicitly stated. So what we've done here is to remove the explicit reference to the completeness axiom in the proof the student sees in order that we can ask them to provide that. Part B and C are to do with students picking out the correct lines of the proof where, so in this case, we want to know where the idea that of a bounded sequence is first used and where an increasing sequence is used. Parts D and E are simple multiple choice questions that are asking the students to pick out the correct definitions of boundedness and convergence. And part F is to find some form of example. So we want the upper bound for the sequence sine of n plus seven. So as I said, this was, a, this was an early question that, that I wrote. And I think that there are some ways that we could improve this. And there are some issues that at the moment, I don't, we don't necessarily have the, the tools to get around. So what do I mean? Well, firstly, part B and C are asking the students for boundedness and increasing sequence, as I said. But the way that I've written the proof above, I actually use the words bounded and increasing. So for example, the answer to C is line five. But in line five, I specifically say, as the sequence is increasing. So in other words, a student who doesn't necessarily understand the proof could game the system and still get a correct answer. The second, the second issue I can think of is that part F isn't necessarily to do with comprehension about this given proof. So maybe I don't need this part. And finally, as I said earlier, I removed the explicit reference to the completeness axiom to ask for it, but is this not slightly counterintuitive because I'm making the proof more complicated to read in all, but I'm still trying to teach students how to understand it. So I'm not saying that I have the answers to all of these questions. I'm just saying these are some of the issues that we are facing when we are trying to come up with these comprehension exercises. So perhaps for the sake of my credibility, I'll move on to my next slide. So these are a couple of examples of other forms of comprehension that we have managed to successfully implement. 
So if I begin on, on the right, I spoke about the idea of fading a proof, and this is exactly an, an example of this. So this is an induction question, and we are asked to prove that the sum of the first n of natural numbers is equal to n squared. Here, the students are provided with the general structure of the proof, but they are asked to give us the statement Pn. Then these dropdowns are true or false questions, and then they are asked to do the suitable calculation. <clears throat> so in this case, it again becomes a decision of how much of the induction structure you want to give to your students. So here, this one is quite heavily sta scaffolded, but as George mentioned earlier, we could roll that back and ask the students to provide more, depending on where this question is appearing, depending on the context. On the other side of the slide, we have something else that we tried, which was to critique a given proof. So here we have an incorrect proof that minus one is equal to one, and the student is asked to find which line this proof goes wrong. And the more interesting thing about this question is this second part here. We ask them, why is this line incorrect? Well, this is an example precisely of a notes answer where we're asking students to type in free form what their reasoning is behind this, behind their answer. So this would, have, this would have to be marked by a human. And in fact, I believe that when we deployed this question, this wasn't for any marks. But this helped us to understand when students were going wrong, what was their reasoning behind going wrong? Why were they going wrong? And all of the questions that we've managed to deploy, we've found that there is actually less of a floor ceiling effect than we would expect. These tasks we're giving students are not necessarily straightforward to them. Whether this is because we are, uh, they aren't asked this in other courses or it's a novelty factor of the things that they've come across. We're not sure, but these things are not, it's not like students are doing these quizzes and then immediately getting 100%. So there seems like there is some value in doing these questions. So what about the future? Well, in the short term, I'm involved in trying to apply these ideas to other topics. So currently I'm, I'm writing some questions to do with linear algebra proofs. <clears throat> Secondly, we need to look into fixing some of the issues that I mentioned. So specifically, even though we have the ability to number lines of a proof, we found that it's still quite difficult to unambiguously refer to specific lines within an argument. There are still issues coming up with that despite the numbering. Thirdly, Chris and I would have liked to do some sort of evaluation of these questions, but we were interrupted by the, the COVID outbreak and we both felt it would be more useful to put these ideas out in the open so that people could have or get some idea about how they might implement similar things into, into your own courses. And finally, this is a question that I, that I don't know the answer to and I would like to investigate. How far can we push these ideas? I, I don't think that we've reached the limit of what we're doing with this yet. We have, I think we've made a, a decent start, but it'll be interesting to see just how far we can go with regards to these of automatically marked comprehension tasks. So finally, where can I go for extra information? Well, as I've said, everything that I've talked about is available in Chris and my paper, which is at the, available on the archive. Um, and as I said, there's a link on the Stack Boodle site. For help formatting proof comprehension questions in Stacks, there is the Stack Docs page. It's very useful. For further information, I would suggest looking at the references we have in our paper. And we will monitor the forum here for the rest of the day. But if you have any questions beyond that, feel free to email me if you're interested. So that was where I was going to end my talk um, before I show an example. So maybe I will stop here for some questions. I don't 
see any questions right now, but Tim had an interesting comment about um, an idea for grading sort of why is this line incorrect style questions. I don't know, Tim, if you want to um, elaborate yourself. Remember to unmute. <clears throat> Um, it was really actually a bit of spam that we've got a question type that can grade short free text responses. Um, if you want another complicated question type for your Moodle site, um, it exists. Just thought I'd let people know that. Okay, thank you. Anything else? There I so the question, does this from our Tim? Tim? Yes. Could I ask you, uh, thank you for raising that. I mean, the work that the OU you've done with the pattern match question type is really impressive. Could I trouble you to post something in the forum about that so people can really follow it up? Uh, yes. Thank you. I think Heather has a question. Heather, do you want to read it out yourself? Hi, yeah, I was just looking at the proof questions because I'm um, going to do some for next term. And of course, maths, natural numbers don't include zero, but in computer science they do. <laughs> um, and I'm having, I'll match the textbook, so I'll have to have zero. So I'll have to talk to Robbie, I think, about that. Is that a spiritual issue about the definition of the natural numbers or a practical issue about stack, Heather? Um, it will be a practical issue in that probably you might have to have two versions of the same question, one that's more computer science, you know, if you were doing a natural number proof, which I noticed Robbie was doing. Yeah, I, I have to say classification issue. In, in other natural numbers proof questions that I've done, I've copped out and just defined them as whatever I want them to be. I said okay. let in one onwards, so it's, it's unambiguous. Okay. Well, we've accommodated the physicist with J for the square root of minus one, so I'm sure we can accommodate the computer scientist with zero as well at some point. We'll fix that. Okay, so just, just raising it to think about. Thank you. So I thought just to end my session, it might be quite useful just to have a look at what the question authoring page looks like for the proof comprehension question that I did. So I thought I would share my screen and just quickly go through that. So let me reshare this. So can everyone see my two stack windows that are open? Yeah. So this is just the Google page for, for this, web, for this uh, workshop. So I'm just going to the question bank and I've put the proof comprehension question in the question bank to have a look at. And on the right is just the, the preview of what it looks like in Slack. So I just thought I'd quickly go through, go through this. Even quicker because George helpfully explained exactly how to do multiple choice questions in Stack. So I don't need to explain any of this other than that in my question variables here are just the answers to each, each, part, of, uh, each part of my question. And these long lists are just the multiple choice options coming up. Did I interrupt actually? So I was noticing a question in the chat. Um, yeah. Which seems that someone else answered basically. But I was interested in your take on it, which is why use stack for this if it's a multiple choice question? Do you think there's an advantage here? Not necessarily. So for us, it was a matter of formatting almost at this point. So we want, on a practical level, we want the student to be able to see the proof as they do the comprehension questions about it. That, that was the main reason. But in theory, you, you certainly could use a, a, the Moodle type multiple choice question, for example. Yeah, so this is keeping it sort of compact, I suppose. It's that, got that's, that's exactly it, yes. as one item. Yeah. So pretty much, pretty much everything we did was kind of from a practical point of view. So it was as we kind of thought for students, for the experience the students have when doing this question, we don't want them having to click back and forth between two different pages, essentially. So yeah, just to quickly go through the 
question text. These are the, the div classes that are explained in the, in the stack docs. So the proof class is precisely the thing that's setting my proof in the pale blue box. Proof line is the, the line of the proof. The numbers just helps with proof numbering. And then we can add in, we can add in proof steps, which are the actual argument in the proof. And then we have the end of the proof itself and then the questions that we're asking our students. And these, again, I would suggest that these aren't necessarily the most complicated questions to input in stack, but I thought it would be useful to have at least an example of how we've laid this, how we've laid this out. And finally, we have just our work solution for each part of the question. So I don't think there's anything to anything else to see really because the potential response trees are pretty simple. Um, so for example, we only need to test in part A whether two is the correct answer. So it's not too difficult to write, write the response trees. So let me... Can I, can I jump in here? Um, yeah. this, you've shown us one question, but the, 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 uh, what struck me about this whole endeavor is quite how many different questions you end up asking on one single proof. So here we've got one of your more complicated single questions, but we have a little bit of time. So could you show colleagues the sequence that you wrote for the um, Cauchy Schwartz inequality? Ah, yes. Because that, I think that has got a Moodle multiple choice where we've actually got a sequence of questions about one proof. So we are using the Moodle multiple choice where it makes sense. Yes. So perhaps you could just, just talk through colleagues this whole sequence where this is, just more than one stack question, isn't it? Yeah, so this is what I've been writing for uh, Introduction to Linear Algebra for next term. So we're attempting to write a proof comprehension quiz per week about one of the most important proofs that students will meet from the book in that week. So in week two, for example, the most we thought it would be good to go through some questions regarding the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. So, we've laid these out in a, as Chris said, in a slightly different manner. So this, I will preview the full quiz. So maybe I can get rid of this window. And maximize that. So here, what we've done is we've written seven questions that are all in some sense related to either directly to the proof of Cauchy Schwartz inequality or related to techniques that are used in the proof of the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. So question one, for example, is just to give to give an example where it, where it holds. Question two is a proof comprehension question where we faded the steps of the calculations. So we expect students to be able to expand the left hand side, expand the right hand side, and then perform the rest of the calculations to get the proof. Ravi, can I just interrupt you quickly? Um, yes. Would you be able to zoom in a little bit? I think um, some people are having a difficulty seeing the, the text. My apologies. Is that, is that better? I think that looks good to me, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. No problem. So I'm, I think the reason that I didn't was because I'm, I'm wedded to the, to the nicer formatting when you look at it to further zoomed out. Um, but yeah, so. Question three would be an example of a Moodle multiple choice question. So here we decided to, instead of having the proof and the question about the proof as one stack question, we've split up everything into separate questions. So this is a Moodle, Moodle multiple choice. And yeah, we expect students to pick out the, the, the times when equality was told. So if I flip to the next page of the quiz, we actually have another multiple choice question. This is again, just testing whether students understand the definition of the projection. And once again, we expect students to pick out the, the correct properties to do with this. Then they're given an example of where they have to find a given projection. And then finally, they're asked to implement this into a second proof of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. 
So, and again, in this case, we have a couple of questions that ask students to, to pick out the correct lines where certain properties are used. And finally, we end, or we are trying to end most weeks with a free text response question. So this is again something I have to type here. We expect students to provide some form of reasoning in this box that has to be assessed hum by a human. And actually there's a box that comes up reminding me of that fact that this isn't going to be assessed by staff. So in this, in this case, we're asking students to debate or to consider why one of the proofs of the poetry shorts that they've met may be better or worse than one of the others. So the hope with that is just to try and get them to, to think about it at a slightly different level. And this is the formatting that we are using for all of our quizzes in ILA. Um, so with question one there, Robbie, mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just look at question one a bit more slowly. How does that fit with your proof baseline checklist? So this, what are we asking the students to do? We're asking to, we're asking them to show an example of the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Part of the checklist is to provide specific examples. I think it was step eight off the top of my head. So this question was precisely created by me writing out our checklist and then writing a question for each point in that checklist or each point that was relevant. Right, and, and that's also about what the theorem's about, isn't it? So it's about dot products. Do the students, this is week two of their university, so do, do they, they really remembered what a dot product is and about norms as well. So just setting the scene before the proof a little bit, isn't it? Exactly. Precisely. And then you do that in question five again when the, the next proof comes on to projections. Exactly. So essentially the, the question about finding an example of a projection, so question five and question one are providing the, the same kind of test. We're asking them to provide some example before they go on to the proof. And then they're asked to use the definition of a projection in the second proof in question six. Okay, so uh, questions colleagues, I think. I think Mark had a question for Robbie earlier. Mark, if you'd like to ask it. <clears throat> oh, hi, Robbie. Th thank you. Um, that was a really in inspiring talk. Uh, it, it's sort of a comment and, and a question. So when, when I'm thinking about courses I've lectured, uh, say in my combinatorics course, I used to have a lot of fun giving bijective proofs of fairly simple binomial identities. And it occurred to me that you, you can sort of run these proofs just by putting explicit numbers in and, and getting explicit bijections between sets. Uh, and I think one thing Stack might be rather good at would be you could ask students, make an instance of this proof and then write down images or uh, domains for these various maps. Uh, and there's some syntax there. So although it's not so deep, we would be leveraging the, the stack computer algebra capabilities. Uh, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on this idea of turning proofs into examples. So I think, I think that's, that's an excellent suggestion. Actually, this is something that we, we do address um, in, in our paper. And it's the, it's the final part of our checklist is precisely this idea. We, so I think, I think there's a slight disconnect between what we as mathematicians do when we read a proof and what students do when we read a proof or what we think they do. And I think we don't necessarily ask them a lot of times to give an example of things like this, precisely as you said. So I think, I think it's a very worthwhile, I think it's a worthwhile thing to be doing. Um, and as I say, I think this, this is part of the, the final point in, in our checklist is to look at questions like this. So can, can you put that slide up again easily? Is it possible to put that? Yeah. Uh, let me give me a second. There we go. So point eight, 
can you follow through the proof steps with a specific example? This is precisely that kind of situation. So I haven't showed them here, but we do have similar questions along those lines. I think it's an excellent idea. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any specific questions for Robbie, but we do have some more general questions we didn't have time for in the earlier talks if we want to move on to general Q&A. I can, I can stop well, sharing. Firstly, thank you, Robbie, for presenting that. Um, um, thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's do that. Let's move on to general, general Q&A. So if we don't have time to answer all these questions, then um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, look at them again this afternoon and fill in the fill in the, the questions on the forum to record the answers there. Um, okay, any suggestions where I should begin? Uh, managing workload, John, yes, okay. So John, you're asking for lots of us, there are lots of questions to code and not enough time. Um, and there, sorry, I'm reading your question. So let me just read that. Is it the case in Edinburgh that there are more people employed to code questions at various levels? Or is it the case mostly that it's the responsibility of the lecturing staff and Constantina? So in the, um, we have employed Constantina, her job is to write stack questions. Um, and I think, I think we think on average that a typical paper-based problem sheet with somewhere between six and 10 questions about two person days is needed to do that. Is that about right, Constantina? Yes, more or less. Two person days. George and Robbie, uh, what, do you want to com comment on workload? It depends, okay. Of course it depends on the kind of questions and the level of the course. And Robbie, I mean, your problem is you're designing the questions, you're not just implementing them, right? So you've got a whole extra layer to think about. Yeah, so I, I think for, for me, as I was saying, I can probably save time with, um, because actually putting questions into stack, um, but it's the design that probably takes, takes more of my time. Um, so just on implementing stack questions, I would say, a day, a day and a half for me, but I think that's on the short side just because of the type of questions I'm looking at. So I did do previous types of questions last year, and I would say two, two to two and a half days is about is about what it would take me. So your problem is one of educational design rather than technical implementation. Actually, it was amusing that Michael's question on can you enter an integer is exactly what you need to make sure that the students have typed in something sensible to identify the line in the proof, isn't it? So you know that's a Clearly a good idea. George, do you want to talk about workload? Um, yeah, so we went about this process of writing a whole course online um, this time two years ago. So that was split between me and um, our colleague Richard Gratwick. Um, and that was our sort of teaching duty for the year was to get this course ready. Um, I think we've done a back of the envelope calculation and I think that was about six months of effort kind of split between us, so six working months. Um, I think that's a kind of safe, comfortable upper limit. Um, well, how many stack questions did you do in six months, George? We've got about a thousand questions in the course. I mean, a lot of them are clones of one another, um, but there's a lot of stuff there. Each week there's um, about a hundred questions worth um, because it's, it's the whole course materials plus the assessment. Um, so there was one week where I was up against it and I was writing the, the week about um, integration methods and I did write that in a week when I was very much in the zone. Um, there, there was a lot of, you know, I, I would get a really good question on integration by substitution and then that would buy me a lot of time. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to say um, how long does it take? It's kind of how long is a piece of string in some ways. Um, I think if you want to get a basic question up and running, it's, yeah, the sort of numbers that we've been hearing, I think are a good estimate. Um, you can spend days and days thinking about what errors are students going to make and trying to put in feedback to preempt those. Um, but I think the approach we've taken is more to do it in cycles. So you'll have a question that's basically working and then part of Constantino's job over the past couple of years has been once students start taking the tests to actually see what they've done and 
identify issues quickly and try to fix the question if there are issues. Is that fair to say? I think, I think as well, in theory, you're going to save time not marking these questions as well. Yeah, how yeah. much time are you spending marking this year, George? Well, that, you know, it was very nice. The, very, the first year of doing it, we had 110 students doing the course. Um, this past year, there was 180. Um, so this year was, I think, the payoff, in a way, of putting in all that effort up front. Um, yeah, I was very pleased that the, the so there was an end of course test on my, my course as well. Um, and while people were doing their exam marking, I was done. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks for raising that, John. You've raised a really important issue about workload, and it's important to have that candid discussion with your head of department. This is upfront extra work, but there is payback, and there's really payback in the second and third years. I would say it's at best cost neutral in the first year because it's extra work, right? I mean, that would be my experience of this. Um, so uh, in Edinburgh, we, we decided to employ Constantina and latterly Robbie and this summer we've um, we've engaged some interns as a response to COVID-19. So we are we're doing that work up front um, because we need to. Um, that's the way it is. OK, do you want to come back on that, John, if you're still with us? Yeah, yeah I'm still with I guess I'd say I like the idea that actually there's, it's, there's a centralised process for reviewing and improving the questions based on what students have done, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's that's quite worthwhile. I think we tend to, well, in the model we use, we tend to leave it up to individuals. So yeah, I think it's a, yeah, interesting. Right, and and so there are new processes that um, online assessment isn't really new, but there are new there are new processes um, and institutional understandings of how workload. You know, if you've given a lecture, traditional lecture course where you show up for two hours a week and do your bit and then there are problem sheets and tutorials to mark. We all have a good sense of how that contributes to the department and how much time it takes and who's doing what. It's um, with newer, newer processes, it's not, um, it's not clear there's a shared understanding of how much time that takes and who's doing the work and how that should be rewarded. Um, we've had an interesting experience in Edinburgh with, um, with exams, marking exams, because we had our exam suddenly became open book and uh, and we sent out the exam papers and we, we gathered the PDFs in and a number of colleagues said they prefer marking the PDFs online and they did mark the traditional papers and, and we had processes for not totaling the marks anymore and actually some of these things were an improvement. Um, so it's just understanding those new processes and how, how best, best to make use of them. I think my big experiment for the next academic cycle will be actually, you know, <laughs> slightly strange to admit it, given what, what I've done with Stack, but to use these human marked question types a bit more and make use of more variety of these question types so that we can have a rounder assessment experience and just accept that some of that will require human marking. But then we were always doing paper based marking, so it will just displace some of that. Yeah. OK, other questions from folk. I can see, uh, oh, I can, sorry, go ahead, um, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, just with uh, respect to human marking, would it be possible to add um, images to, um, for human marking in uh, stack questions? I know so you can have essay questions mixed with stack, but uh, as a part of a stack question, would that be possible? Um, let me, sh so we've been doing, you know, again, as a response to COVID and to try and understand the tools that we've got available, we have been doing some, um, uh, sorry, let's go to site home. I'm struggling to, I'm reacting now rather than planning to show you. We've been doing some little experiments with human marking and we, we created this little quiz and the, I won't show you my colleagues attempts because I haven't asked them if that's okay, but I'll, I'll the group chat, let's get rid of that. So um, this is what the the um, this is what the stack question looks like, and the advantage of this is that you get synchronous LaTeX, and you can see your answer as a student. So, but that of course requires the students to type in LaTeX. But the yeah, other but option, right? Well, fair enough. We may want to teach our students LaTeX, right? I mean, that, but we haven't decided that yet. The second option is um, just to type your answer. This is the Moodle essay question. 
So yeah. this is my art, so you get no preview there, but you, uh, and then the other option is to upload a file, right? So the students can take a photograph of their work and upload it. And we've got all those facilities already. I haven't changed anything. We've had these for years, we've just never used them. Um, and I'm over the next semester, we're going to be accepting more electronic work. And I think as a rounded, a rounded assessment experience, some automatically marked stuff and some human marked stuff, just as students hand in work, um, we can ask them to uh, hand in work on paper, we can ask them to upload photographs. Actually, they've been doing that quite happily with their mobile phones. It really hasn't created a lot of drama. Um, I, <laughs> my first year, my first year linear algebra class has uh, about 700 students and I was cycling back from the lecture theatre to King's Building with 700 um, bits of work in 65 separate folders to distribute to tutors. It was all a bit crazy and I, I won't miss doing that. <laughs> It was becoming a serious manual handling issue. Um, so there are just some things that will improve over time. And I'd be interested to find out what other folk are doing. So if you've got suggestions of what we can do, again, Tim's already uh, rightly uh, talked about the P-match question type that the OU have used for years. That's an excellent tool. There are plenty of other things to, to complement what we're doing. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, just pasting figures from the clipboard would be a uh, valuable feature. Yeah, okay, I'm happy to discuss that. So the, the, the question then is, is this part of stack or is this a new question type, right? And how that fits with the other existing question types. Yeah, there was discussion with uh, the essay question and the editor properties and uh, the circumstances that this works or not. <laughs> And um, yeah, but uh, a workflow of having, making a screenshot, uh, writing a file, and then picking that file, that's not accepted by the students. They just want to paste it. Right. Good. And we're, we're experimenting with, um, you know, writing on tablets and capturing that and all sorts of things going on. There's going to be a lot going on over this summer. There is that's a lot going on. Available commercially, right? Yeah. The, the virus question, I think, uh, has this stuff. Can I just okay. say about pasting images into Moodle, um, that used, it used to be very dangerous. When you pasted an image in, the browser would do something that made it look like it worked, and then you'd save the page and it, the image would disappear. That's finally been fixed in Moodle 3.9, which was just released last week. Now pasting images into the editor actually works. Regardless of any other settings or which editor you use or just for Atto? Uh, just Atto. And in the essay, it's a setting whether you want to allow students to embed images. So when you create the essay, you can choose to either just allow text or allow text with embedded images. So oh, yeah, that, that's valuable addition, of course. Well, this feels to me like a sensible place to, um, to stop. We will answer. There are, there, I can see there are some technical questions about the uh, in the forum, and I think it would be better just to to actually write an answer in the forum to those than, than just discussing them. Uh, talking about code is difficult, isn't it? So I think we'll just, um, we'll just answer those asynchronously. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, thank you, George and Constantina for your talks. I really appreciate you making the effort to put those together. Thanks everyone for uh, attending online. I hope that was interesting. Um, Robbie referred to a paper that we'd written. I have to confess that we have Put that paper out. We were planning to do a year of evaluation with our students. Unfortunately, that's been disrupted. But in the interest of helping, trying to help colleagues uh, assess proof online, we've put those ideas out into the open and we'd be very interested in what you make of those and any suggestions and improvements and follow up. So please keep in touch with us and um, let us know how you get on. Thanks very much. <laughs>